Hi everyone. Um, so those who don't know me, I'm Swati. I'm a master's student in Wright State. So I'll be presenting on this cognitive computer. Uh, so this book was written by Sank in 1984, uh, the cognitive computer. I'm, I'll be discussing a, about the chapter six, knowledge structures. What Sank had to <coughs> tell in 1984 about knowledge structures and what has been done now. So, uh, first thing is intelligent computers. In the, in the book he's saying, what are intelligent computers? So, getting computers <coughs> to behave intelligently. What does that mean, intelligently? That means that we are giving them all the detailed knowledge about our world, our real world. And then we are asking the computer to interpret that knowledge in its language and then give us back some kind of information we want. Oh. Next, this is our human brain. So we can find exactly the knowledge we need in a given situation effortlessly. Suppose we are going to a restaurant, then we know how to behave in a restaurant. Suppose um, I'm giving this presentation, then I know that I need to stand here and I need to present this. So how do I know what, what is appropriate in, in a particular situation? Like in a particular uh, script, what kind of questions should be asked? What kind of reactions should we give? That can be easily interpreted through the human brain, but how does the computer do it? That is what uh, is it trying to say. So, uh, yeah, so the problem of getting machines to apply knowledge in the same way as we are doing, as our human brain is behaving, that is knowledge representation. Uh, so let me ask you, so how do you know how to behave right here? Experience. Is that it? Yeah, the first uh, uh, What about the context? What about the context? Location. What else? Mm -hmm. what the room. Uh, presentation. The, the podium, yes. the audience, yes. the screen. There's a lot of artifacts here yes. that so tell you how you're supposed to behave. <laughs> also, uh, who is in the room? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not here, half of you will be gone, right? <laughs> but I'll report. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So how do we make computers realize those situations? That's the question. Uh, uh, yeah, th this is a situation. A man in a restaurant <coughs> will ask the waitress, can you get me a sandwich? Then the waitress is going to respond, yes sir, what kind of sandwich would you like to have? This is the situation in a restaurant. But what if the situation or the context is changed? The man meets the same waitress in a bus. He, he will ask her, can you give me a sandwich? Then, then the lady, what is he going to ask? Are you crazy? Do I need to give you a sandwich here? So that's the um, uh, use of appropriate conceptual tools in a particular given situation. So that's where um, context is coming. And knowledge structures. Now, knowledge structures and uh, knowledge is that allows us to make sense of the context or the situation. So here is an example which was given in the book by Sang, The Mad Lips. It's a story game. Um, it's, it's a game story um, about, a, it's a game about stories. So suppose this is the example. As John was walking along, the, it, it's all blank, and it's mentioned that it's a noun. He noticed a restaurant called P.F. Chang's. Shank had not mentioned it, I mentioned it, changed it, because P.F. Chang's is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and walked in. The noun came over to him and said, hi, what would you like to desk, verb? John looked at the noun and said, I'll have to, um, I'll have the oven broiled dash. That's a noun. It sounds adjective. The waitress brought him his food. This is the game we are going to play. Now, case one. Madlib doesn't know the context of the words it chooses. That's the <coughs> problem with Madlibs. It only knows the parts of speech of words which are given to it in the previous, in the question. So, it will choose any noun for using in place of noun, any verb for using in place of verbs. <coughs> yeah. So this is how Madlib will do it. So 
solve the problem. As John was walking along the hubcap, he noticed a restaurant called P.F. Chang's and walked in. The umbrella came over to him and said, Hi, what would you like to eradicate? That's a verb, right? John looked at the bed and said, I'll have the oven broiled tractor. It sounds obvious. It's an adjective. The waitress brought him his food. Grammatically, this solution done by Matt Lips is correct, but it makes no sense because it doesn't relate to the context. We know the context. Humans, how will we solve the example? As John was walking along the we know street, we can interpret it from the story. He noticed a restaurant called P.F. Chang's and walked in. Who should come over? Either the waiter or the waitress. So the waitress came over to him and said, Hi, what would you like to eat or drink? That's what we do in a restaurant. John looked at the menu. That's what we know from our experience. In the restaurant, this thing our scripts happen. And said, I'll have the oven broiled whatever, chicken or anything, not oven broiled tractor. Right? It sounds delicious. That's the adjective we need to use there. It sounds yummy or anything. The adjective which is relative to the constant context or the situation. The waitress <coughs> bought him his food. Now this solution makes con makes sense. So uh, human or us, we are equipped with knowledge structures that allow us to make sense of stories about going to restaurant. We knew that we are going to restaurant and these are the kind of nouns or verbs we need to use here. We need to give the computer the same knowledge structures that will tell him that, buddy, these are the stuffs you are going to expect in a restaurant. So you need to solve the example like this. Excuse me, uh, Can you go back to slides? Yeah, one more, yeah. Um, you give an example for the restaurant, so someone goes to the restaurant, they know that, okay, this is the time for asking what's the food, so we know it by our knowledge. Yeah. But without knowledge, our brain also can guess, right? So it's not necessarily always we have knowledge. Let's say it's first time I went to a restaurant, or first time I went to the uh, seven-star hotels, and I don't know what's the policy here, right? Yes. So I sit and I guess. So one of the, I think, um, if you don't have knowledge in your brain also, so another job of the brain is prediction. So we will predict, okay, now one person has to come and ask us, or maybe they give some, uh, something to us. If we don't have knowledge about that area, but still our brain yes. can guess. Yes. Yeah, this, this 1984 version is, is a tad too mentalistic for me. Um, and it, it seems to imply that all of the knowledge is pre-stored in our heads. And I think we've made some progress in, in, in that regard, well, recognizing that you can adapt and construct. Yeah, but you don't have <laughs> to have visited um, a restaurant to have the knowledge about a restaurant because you might have watched a movie, you might have uh, heard a discussion, you might have read about it. There are many ways uh, that you might have been exposed. It's like so many people in this group have come to US for the very first time and yet many of them have seen enough movies and uh, uh, met people who have been US and they are uh, kind of aware of what to expect and uh, uh, none of them really come out as totally you know, uh, a stranger. Huh? Totally a stranger. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 yeah, they more or less uh, fit in very well. They more or less uh, ease into the things. Yes, they may be doing refinement to their understanding of how to behave as the time goes. But otherwise, still, um, I think uh, there be other indirect uh, piece of knowledge that you'd have to uh, do, and it's not just the explicit knowledge of exactly having done that. Yes. Uh, also, the point you make in terms of uh, example, right? We yes. can we can go somewhere without uh, something completely new. So yes, example. Even if you saw a movie, so you have knowledge. Mm. So you have knowledge, right? Mm. You got knowledge and you store it, and you mm. know, okay, you compare this mm. restaurant is compared. So I said without knowledge. Mm. So for a seven star hotel, maybe we didn't see in a hotel. Okay, well, how is their room? How is their facility? So maybe we cannot guess. It's not familiar everywhere, right? That's why uh, our brain is still. Come up, hmm? uh, comes hmm? up with hmm? the prediction hmm? and uh, well, the, the prediction the, may not be the best word, but yeah, the brain uh, comes. Yeah, like uh, uh, analyzing that. Okay, what will happen? Or what is that? What I mean? Like we know that if we go to a restaurant and we are supposed to eat, then we are going to eat chicken or anything else, not the tractor, right? <laughs> <laughs> that that's that that kind of thing. 
course, this is Shank 84. Yes. And Shank, somebody better give me a date for case-based reasoning. 90-something, Shank? 90s. It was in 90s. Yes. Yeah. The, ne the next iteration was case-based reasoning. Yes. Right? Which was much yes. more specific, context-specific. Yes. So if here in this book in 1984, he was like... Generic scripts. Yeah, generic scripts. Mm -hmm. And looking into case-based reasoning. That's what I can infer. So next he talks about scripts. What, what are scripts? Knowledge structures that are used in particular situations, right? So there should be a script for, um, like a script means, yeah, like a script for a play, a script for a knowledge structure. But just now Farah pointed out that we should know about going to any place. Our mind is coming up with that. So that are the, those are the scripts. So scripts are prepackaged sets of expectations, <coughs> inferences, and knowledge for every situation. So scripts, they provide connectivity between events. So how does human brain make sense of a story? This connects to the scripts that we have, the prepackaged knowledge that we have in our brain through our experiences and with knowledge from every kind of situation or watching a movie or anything. And then we combine it to come up with what context we should apply in that situation. So, for example, John went to a restaurant, he asked the waitress for cocaine, he paid the check and left. These three sentences are connected by our ability to reference a script. We have formed based on our own experiences. So we can connect these three sentences. That, okay, John went to a restaurant, that is one. Another is he asked the waitress for cocaine. Another is he paid the check and he left. We can infer the complete story based on our experience that how do we need to behave in a restaurant. <coughs> What happens when we go to a restaurant? So that depends on the restaurant script. But knowledge of the possible, like what could have happened or what could happen. Script tells us what to expect, such as the interior of the restaurant, the taste of the food, etc. in this example. And it also tells us what not to expect, such as waitress gave John a manicure while he was waiting for his food. This is not going to happen, right? So there, those things are mentioned in the script that is given as the knowledge structure. So there are some rules for scripts, like expectations of what is going to happen next and why is it going to happen next, what kind of situations are we going to face. So um, scripts, basically they are representing the knowledge that we are using in our daily activities. What do we do next? So, uh, this thing has been done uh, after the book like uh, to represent knowledge, POS tagging. So uh, I just wanted to bring out like what Sank had to say in 1984 and what already has been done. So the POS refers to a category of words which have similar grammatical properties. So from that we can infer out using POS tagging that the, these words have the similar grammatical properties, that these are nouns. So we can separate them. Uh, Words that are assigned to the same POS category generally play similar roles within the grammatical structure of sentences. Algorithms for POS, there are two categories of algorithms, rule-based <coughs> and stochastic algorithms. I didn't get into the details of those, but uh, this, no, uh, what I know from little bit knowledge about everything, stochastic POS algorithms are based on supervised learning models, so uh, this can, this work has been already done. We, this is the thing which was not back in 1984, but now we know how to represent words. These slides you you made yourself, or it's it? No, this is a, where while uh, searching and studying, I took whatever from wherever sources I got from. Excellent, excellent, yes. good. I like that. Because I was, I'm glad to see, you know, so you for example mentioned CRF that was not there when Shai wrote the book. Yeah, no, this this was not there. This is a presentation given by another um, student in 2015. So this, mm -hmm. this was uh, from that slide. One very important thing, because, for example, we put this on the web and anything like that. Anyone otherwise, uh, if you got this thing from anybody, make sure you, uh, you know, cite that 
so it could be if you have used it exactly verbatim you should put a quote or say from okay. and if you changed it to some extent uh, then uh, you can say adapted from okay. but that must should go and also whenever you took any figure from anywhere else make sure you give reference credit colon and then give that link okay all the figures and everything everything okay. uh, and uh, uh, just so that I'm going to stop this here so uh, next the work has been done in word segmentation word segmentation it, it's a difficult problem in many of the languages right as there is no explicit delimiter so um, how to segment the words for segmenting phrases such as the complete natural language processing it's a full one phrase right a simple ngram lookup will be suffice so ngram lookup and there are more of these algorithms like um, unigram bigram and trigram based language models that have been used work has been done Con so we consider every possible way to split the text into a first word followed by the remaining text of the word um, the remaining text of the sentence that's the way how we split and we analyze each each by each phase by phase or segment by segment for each split the best way to segment the remaining phrase is computed right then the split uh, corresponds to the highest priority or the first pri remaining priority <coughs> is um, and then it is uh, categorized right p first is the priority first and p remaining is the next split that is the remaining again that remaining part again we'll split it into p first and then p remaining that way we will segment word by word and then we can derive the knowledge from that full sentence how do we make computers understand proverbs like our human human brain does so uh, this this i uh, checked from this is the article which sank had published in november 30 2015 so in this yeah this this is an example a pig with two masters will soon starve that's a proverb if we do keyword analysis uh, in this article what he has talked about is uh, yeah so if we do a uh, keyword analysis on this proverb <coughs> we'll get suppose there is a question on jeopardy like watson will lose according to sank watson will lose in analyzing the meaning out of this proverb anybody will think that uh what why is the guy talking ab about pigs this is the question right we were not discussing about pigs so what is the meaning the meaning of the proverb it will come up as a computer will process <coughs> it as a pig that's a pig with two masters the pig has two masters will soon start why will a pig with two masters start he has two persons to feed him why will he start so what's the meaning of the proverb that meaning cannot be analyzed by keyword analysis that meaning how do we make the computer understand these kind of proverbs human brains we can understand here the pig refers to a worker masters means he is two bosses so uh, we we can get out the meaning that he was telling me uh, this is the meaning he is explaining either of the masters might feed the pig that means if each one thought the other was doing the feeding so he is not talking about pigs this proverb is not actually about pigs it is about humans it's about an employer with two bosses he is telling this proverb is telling that neither master uh, sorry neither boss will think that they need to look out for the employer so by that the employer is screwed that's the proverb's meaning but computer cannot get that <coughs> meaning out how do we extract the meaning of the proverb another example he is given is you can lead a horse to water but you can't make him drink so uh, just a thought um when i used to study language in you know my other tongue gujarati so we used to have you know the teacher would go through proverb after proverb after proverb you know kind of and i used to make a big diary you know note of all the proverbs and all that 
would it help if I have a lot of proverbs, a database of all the proverbs? But yes. if we have a database of all the proverbs that, I, that we have, yeah. it, it might help. But if we don't know uh, any proverb coming up. So the no, so question is, are, other than having prior knowledge or additional source of all the proverbs so that you are alerted that this could be a proverb <coughs> rather than, you know, to be seen, so, uh, some a text that should be understood literally, is there other, are there other techniques that you've seen people discuss or you don't know? No, hmm. I don't know. It, it, it does say that, that that's the thing we need to figure out now. Hmm. How do we extract the meaning? Suppose there is a proverb, we don't know the meaning of the proverb. It is not previously defined. How do we extract the meaning out of that proverb? Hmm. So, so, so what would human brain do? Suppose uh, there, is, suppose there <coughs> happens to be a proverb that uh, you come across. You don't know that proverb. What would you do? What, what, what would happen? Well, uh, I didn't know the proverb that the, the pigs uh, mm. with two masters mm. will start. Mm. Mm. So how the human brain will start thinking? Mm. That why? Mm. The first question will come why? Why will why will a pig with two masters start? Mm. Then or they say or the, the, you 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 notice that this doesn't make sense. This as doesn't you're make sense. Mm. Then we need to change the context that mm. this is not about pigs. Mm. That's where we figure out that this context is wrong. Right. We need to well. Go Context is right, it's just that the, the, no, the thing yeah. that was said yeah. doesn't fit yeah. with the context. Doesn't so you have fit. to do a search on, you know, on an interpretation of the language okay. that, that makes sense. I think the real worry with these examples is not just the proverbs, it's how much of language is not actually compositional. Hmm. That's the big problem. Hmm. I, I gave you guys a figure, I can't remember where, where I read it, and I said it's some... It's some very frightening number, like like 50% or something like that, where you can't get the meaning of the language from the words itself. Yeah. Mm. That's a big threat to us. Yeah. So the, you, 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 having the context might help, but even that also goes only so long, right? Yeah. So far, right? Mm. Even, even having the context, deriving the meaning, is yeah. that's the challenge. Um, I don't know why. I have no idea how we should do this. Well, I think Amit's idea of a, of, of a lexicon yeah. based on, you know, engrams is, is an interesting one. Yes. It won't solve the whole problem, but it will it will help. But um, I know I use a lot of this kind of language when I speak to, to foreign students. Mm. Not the sharpest pencil, not the brightest crayon in the box. Mm. One sandwich short of a picnic. Have you guys heard that one? One sandwich short. That means not enough, not quite enough to do the job. <laughs> Now coming yeah. back to the scripts, uh, all the restaurant scripts, again, in this example, they will have different scripts for different track of restaurants, right? So different tracks for every script. That means if you are going to a restaurant again, then it's divided. Whether you are going to a coffee shop or we are going to a French restaurant list, all uh, any French restaurant, or we are going to have some snacks, they, ha they will have different scripts for different restaurants. Like you are not, we are, we should know how we are going to behave if we go to a French restaurant. Like we are supposed to be asked to sit there. We need to wait for a, a waitress or anything to come up and anybody. And then what is the process that we need to expect in that restaurant? And what is the process that we need to expect when we go to a McDonald's or a KFC? Similarly, every restaurant script will be different. So in this uh, context, <coughs> understanding the different entering, ordering, and the paying scenes, that's the situation here. So is this, is this Shank 1984? He or whatever this it, was, 1986 yeah. or whatever? Yeah, he told this and I added these images from Google. S so is the claim then that I need a Wendy's script and a KFC script and a Burger King script and, and um, a McDonald's script? Is that, is that the yes. claim? So no, not Wendy's or anything. The claim is that uh, we need to differentiate that uh, between restaurant. These are the those. Yeah. Okay. Those. These are the, the Domino's, Pizza, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, Burger King. Okay. They will have a similar kind of. Yeah. Script. No. Domino's Pizza doesn't work the same way as Burger King. But they they come into the same category as Pizza Hut, right? It's not the but same. they are different from the coffee shops. The, yes. Again, within these we can categorize, subcategorize. Within the this image, 
the category McDonald's or KFC again we can subcategorize right again we will have different scripts yeah we can say which one has offer which one doesn't have yeah which one delivery they have which one doesn't have delivery where does this end Gosh, you know, the dominoes that's it. For um, example, one of them they charge for delivery, the other one doesn't charge. So we so have different scripts for all this. That you can be say, Why Boy, your brain, brain is yeah. crowded. <laughs> so, uh, this is the example which we have given in the book. This, I took the screens out of the book. Um, applying scripts. How do we apply the scripts? So this is the example restaurant script, coffee shop track. We are not going on the Domino's track or the French restaurant track. This example is about the coffee shop track. So while writing a computer program, we need to give the set of expectations in terms of the underlying events represented conceptually. So this script, the script is restaurant, track is the coffee shop. What are the props that we are going to expect in this coffee shop track restaurant? Tables, menu, food, check, money. What is the role of people? Either there is a customer or there is a waitress or waiter and there is a cook. There is no, I don't think there is anybody else in a coffee shop restaurant track. Yeah. Well, there might be a cashier. Yeah, there might be. That, that again depends on uh, the event, how you are paying, how you are supposed to pay. Suppose you are paying through, um, the waitress can take, take, take the credit card she works as the cashier also and there might be any other person employed as the cashier. So I think in this case the waitress and the cashier roles are combined. So I need a, new, a special script for the restaurants that have the waitress cashier combined role. And That's another one. to define. Huh? That's how we are defining. Mm -hmm. no. And the entry conditions, they should be uh, mentioned as there, may, there are two entry conditions that he has defined in this book. Customer is hungry, either he is hungry and he went to the restaurant. Second part, he has money. He just went to go enjoy in a coffee shop. So he went there. Results, what kind of results do we get in this situation? Customer has less money, he is not able to pay. Customer has more money, this is the result we might get. He might able to give more amount of tip or anything, more than he even ate, ate or used. Customer is not hungry at all. He just came there to hang out with friends or anything. Customer is pleased. That's an optional option. Whether he is pleased or he is not pleased. <coughs> then we define different scenes. So what are the scenes? First scene one, entering the restaurant. When you enter the restaurant, first go into the restaurant, look at the tables, decide where to sit, go to table, and then sit. But one thing which is me, which is not here is that uh, go into a restaurant, look at the tables and maybe wait for somebody to get you seated. But this thing, uh, according to this book, is not expected in a coffee shop restaurant. We just can go there and <coughs> sit there. But that again depends. On what? Whether we need to wait there and How go and know? sit or not. How do you know? I'll just go, if I go to any shop or any restaurant, I'll just go and wait there for some time. And That's see if nobody know. is there coming. There isn't anything else. There's That's anything from else. experience. Yeah. 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 There's going to be, if, there's, if you have to wait to be seated, there's going to be something that looks a lot yes. like that podium yeah. at the front. So if there is uh, so uh, if there is nothing that uh, can in direct us to think that uh, we don't need for someone to get a seat and then we can just go and right sit. right yeah so a, a, a lot of what structures our behavior including whether or not we're going to sit has to do with the physical environment yes that that is the interior is the interior design of the restaurant yeah and those things will be covering this I think. Next is scene two, ordering. Ordering will be divided as there is a menu on table. In that case, you pick up the menu. Or waitress might be bringing you the menu. 
or you can ask for menu there are three three scenarios in the third we can signal the waitress then waitress arrives at table then we ask for menu and then waitress gives us menu so these three scenarios will come in ordering how do we expect how to order either of these three out of all the three any one is possible and then we come to reading the menu next step then reading the menu then decide we need to choose which food choice and then signal the waitress that yeah i am ready then waitress arrives then we need to tell the waitress i want whatever food you i have chosen next step is waitress goes to cook waiter tells um, cook to cook whatever uh, we have chosen chosen um, chosen and then cook tells waitress there is no food this might be a scenario waitress arrives at table and then she says there is no food of your choice maybe you can go back go back to see the menu or you can go to scene 4 there is scene 4 that is exit at no uh, at no path right second cook prepares the food and then we can go to scene 3 scene 3 is eating eating again is described step by step cook gives food choice to waitress waitress give food choice to you you <coughs> again you have a optional optionally return to scene 2 to, to order some more if you want some more food so you can again look up at the menu and again the same thing can be repeated this is how the computer should be programmed giving all the scenes and all the details about the script but one more way you have to computer has to describe so this is always one way right so you should have another way okay you choose the food and uh, there is no food that food so yeah. you have to leave so it possible that you choose one kind of food and they don't have as so, okay thank you no i'm going so always you should have one another way also to leave not always go to the uh, here the way it, it is there choose, right? um, uh, if i'm correct this, this is is this the part that you are saying about that uh, if there is no food then you have, have to leave yeah you have to leave it is going to seem for no in this case pie. that's no play yeah, this is no food go back that is go back no go, go back, back or again go back or go to scene 4 scene 4 is exiting exiting okay yeah. okay cat exiting yeah yeah no see this is scene 4 exiting so in that case if there is no food either you go to go back to you know, look at the menu and then again repeat the scene or you can come to the exiting scene exiting scene is, there can be two types of exiting scene the waitress arrives next you can signal the waitress to arrive she doesn't know that you are going to go so in any case the waitress <coughs> arrives at your table and then you can ask for the check or the waitress gives you the check then you you can leave some tip on table or you can go to the cashier again give money to cashier and leave the restaurant this is the no pay path the leave to a restaurant is the no pay path so in this case previously when there was no food it was mentioned go to scene 4 at no pay path you don't pay anything you you going to skip all the uh, paying processes and then directly no pay and exit but this excluded some of the possibilities this script you need to be waited uh, wait to be seated scene that is what we were discussing that whether we need to wait to be seated or not again there is a possibility that we saw someone we know in in the restaurant <coughs> that's another scene which can be created again paying by credit card in this example it has mentioned about paying to the cashier we can pay by credit card that can be uh, also computerized given to the program that you can pay by credit card option and the interior decor of the restaurant which will include the podium if you want to go if somebody is there to ask you to be seated everything that we give our feedback about this includes everything those can those are the excluded possibilities so the restaurant script it is a giant chain of events connected to each other by the causal relationship between them every scene is related to each other the co- the causal relationship 
connects all the chain of events and then the script is generated. Wait a minute, say that again? Then the script is generated? Oh, no. Um, uh, 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 this is an important point. Does the script exist before? Yeah, the script exists before. The script gives us the chain of events. Mm -hmm. No, the script is not generated. That's my mistake. Well, the script exists actually, before. it's not a mistake, but it's just a distinction. Um, so just just a just a um, thought or perspective um, for so uh, many years, what I saw in computer science <coughs> literature, in particularly I come from database uh, background and so data modeling and those kind of stuff, and I would not see uh, modeling of causal relationships in the traditional database, uh, you know, data models, right? And that always bugged me quite a bit. And you know, in, in the real world, uh, a lot of things in tomorrow, causality is extremely important. And the causal relation is extremely important. So um, at least for uh, the work that we did, uh, we, we explored um, this thing to some level in a project called InfoQuill. Um, uh, and uh, investigated the complexity of modeling causal relationship. So we had um, examples like um, uh, nuclear um, test result in a small earthquake, earthquakes, or um, earthquakes result in, cause tsunami, result in tsunami, in this causal relationship, earthquakes. And when you try to model this causality, it's very complicated um, in that in the um, uh, so for example um, we wanted to model uh, this nuclear test lead to earthquakes and then you look at the data and you find that um, uh, the result is not the, you know is statistical kind of things whereby you notice that if the nuclear test uh, if the earthquakes are large there is no causality, there is no link between the nuclear test and earthquakes. But if earthquakes are for the small earthquakes, then you see more relationship. Further, the relationship is, uh, you know, uh, again uh, has parameters of spatial temporal thing, meaning if there is a, after the uh, nuclear test, um, if there is a causality then uh, in, in terms of um, uh, earthquake, that or similar, this this fracking, um, you know, you see that. Then it will be in a nearby geographic area, in uh, you know time that is you know bound. It's not like uh, you did uh, fracking now and uh, somehow earthquake comes very very long far, or, or at least nuclear test and earthquake comes one year later. That you know, there is no you know way to establish that kind of causality. So it's spatial temporal. Perhaps it is even if you have the knowledge geographical features on the ground. Right. So there are these causality relationship can be very uh, uh, complex and hence would require a very expressive representation system. So this is a very rich area of work. This is also why that book, uh, you know, where one of the, you know, the guy, uh, or, uh, um, you know, participant from uh, Iran talked about that chapter on, you know, relationship thing. That's why also, that's why that book was also very attractive. Okay, so understanding the relationship. But again, again the takeaway is that in much of the work in database and semantic data modeling, even in the knowledge representation, much of the focus has been um, on simple relationships, uh, the relationship as in inheritance, right? Class of class relationship and membership. Right? If you look, if you look at the most uh, utilized uh, <coughs> representation framework, which is essentially uh, either description logic or you know. KL1 system and frame based system and number of early AI systems, only things that are model or object oriented programming are these two relationship membership and uh, inheritance. Right? Uh, yes? We, we uh, looked at published data on the web, and uh, there was no single cor corpus per se. There were a number of technical reports in PDF. There were some data sets somewhere. 
on the web, in web pages, and HTML, and whole variety of things. So we just constructed, you know, there existed some data to demonstrate the possibilities. But otherwise, we are not. Uh, we our work was in modeling of the causality using multi ontology uh, thing. To my knowledge, uh, work in InfoQuilt in 1992, 92, no, 88, 90. Yeah, in some, some long time ago. No, I, I don't remember now when exactly. So uh, it was in my early days in uh, in in, um, um, uh, in Georgia. So it is ninety. This was sorry. This was ninety eight. Ninety eight. Yeah, ninety eight. You mean the VLDB paper? Uh, no, it was after after the ninety six VLDB paper. Uh, the um, uh, the first project that I know of, which did facetic facetic search, semantic search, browser based semantic search, was the InfoQuill project. Which became commercial product Adaptex Harness, and this was a follow-on to InfoQuill project, where we wanted to, where we, I believe these were the first examples of multi-ontology relationships. So we expressed the relationship that required um, participation of multiple ontologies. You had ontology for earthquake, your ontology for um, uh, you know um, uh, nuclear <coughs> test, your ontology for other things that you had to model. And you had to put spatial and temporal and other constraints on the expression of relationships to ex show the causality. So There's a very nice diagram I'll show you one of the days. So are you arguing that we should try to model the causality? Oh, of course. We uh, I mean, should. Uh, we should. And, so, and a how lot of good a job does this do of that? These are still linguistically yeah. limited. So uh, I was, I was uh, you know, more involved in, and I'm not an expert in here this at all, uh, I was uh, more involved in uh, causality in uh, rich uh, multidimensional data space, uh, in, in more in structured data, uh, as opposed to this one. So yeah, the, to me, this is, this is compiled knowledge. Mm -hmm. This is the result of a of a model, a causal model, a set of constraints, social constraints, out of which you can generate this thing. But the mistake that we made at the time, this is 1980, whatever you said, four, eighty six, something like that, was the assumption that this captured human knowledge, and mm. I think a better mm. representation is on top of it, the causal constraints out of which we can generate on the fly mm. appropriate behavior for a particular mm. situation. No, as an aside, this is a point I wanted to make because there's some students who are helping you know, with my keynote uh, and other things, and one of the points that I've been making in the last few keynotes is that we uh, model the world with a lot of simplicity. When in computational models are very limited, we model some aspect of the real world that is very complex. And there is clearly um, a progress, uh, recent, particularly more recently, about trying to capture more parameters, more aspects of the real world. And yet, we are way behind, and there's so much more to do. And the work that we did in late 90s is still not progress. So after that work, I have hardly seen any work that talked about multi-ontology query processing. And I have very concrete, real-world example of multi-ontology, you know, uh, 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 relationship modeling. And then this was all the, uh, you know, there's so there's paper on uh, re defining, relation, defining, um, uh, representing, sorry, representing, and then validating, expressing, and validating. I forget all the things, but there were all aspects of this relationship, whole life cycle of relationship that I we talked about in one paper. Uh, uh, yeah. Like I said, uh, recently there are a couple of work regarding federated queries. That means uh, to target multiple data sets, multiple ontology, and so the queries actually require this kind of mm -hmm. relationship mm -hmm. across. Mm -hmm. And what was the first work in that area? Hardy, maybe. Huh? Observer. 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 That I know, at least. But I, you know, you're all welcome to validate it. But that's what I know. You know what the observer's thing is? We had in the beginning of the course. Okay. No, <laughs> no, we didn't. Uh, so, so observer was the first uh, work that did multi-ontology query processing. 1996. 90, you know, we did work in 94, but uh, published in 96 in CI uh, in UPIS, UPIS conference, and then. Uh, the uh, published two journal papers in 2000. Uh, I think they have a few hundred. Uh, one of them has maybe what thousand citations now. Um, but um, um, <coughs> but uh, if you look at the 
uh, some of you, I, one of you made a comment um, uh, in the, that this uh, dialogue or interview, uh, we, I end with, uh, you know, the key challenging aspect on semantics, how the objects are related, right? And um, um, uh, I say, oh, these two objects are exactly the same and same as, right? That is very well studied. And these two objects are related precisely as such. And then these two objects are, um, uh, uh, they resemble each other. They, they somehow are there, but I can't exactly say what it is. See, in the real world, uh, and, and of course, two objects are not related for sure. There are no memberships that uh, intersect as an example, so I can formally define them. In the, um, in the real world, we know how to deal with this reasonably well. Our brains are well adapted to that. In the computer science, we have done very poor, very limited <coughs> job of that. Right? So that's why I make, uh, whenever uh, I have a chance to express my opinion, uh, the uh, work on um, uh, the ontology alignment be, you know, is, is very, very uh, limited uh, in terms of the relationship they have. Right? So here are two ontologies, they are different concepts, they are modeled by different people. Obviously, there are going to be a lot of oh, mismatch, they, you know, a lot of things that will not be exact. And a lot of things that may not be, even when they're not exact, you cannot actually formally capture exactly how they are related. So how do you deal with those stuff? So, uh, you know, the, those, those of us who came from traditional knowledge representation have shied away from probabilistic modeling. But that's what you need to go to, right? The best, that may be the best thing or fuzzy thing. This is where, that's, that's what you have to go, uh, you know, go to. Or conditional thing or contextual thing. That in two contexts, in this context, two objects are related. The same two objects in other contexts are not related. Some of you may be aware, in my semantic course, I would have given the example of switch modeling. Right? So I don't know if, you, you know, those of you who have taken my co course on semantic web. So in, in the context of um, uh, 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 a, a telephone loop, uh, this thing is related. In what context of inter-office connections in telephone network, these are not related. I'll, I'll talk about it later on in the class in the fall. So all that richness of repre re relationship representation you know, uh, that we have between objects, we've not done a very good job. And, and I continue to believe that that remains a very rich area of uh, research and investigation, right? Roshan, yeah. this year's ESWC ended with same as, using same as, all same as. Uh -huh. They had a paper, I think, I, I don't remember whether Frank is a co-author. Hmm. Uh, they, they said, like, considering the same as, you don't have to check all the things in some context. Hmm. You can still use the existing same as. They, they semantically mean the same thing, but when, you, when the context changes, the same as no longer works. So they, do, they made some analysis. Contextualized semantics. Same as is not same. The same as is not same. Is that what you saying? No, no. Even yeah, though the same as exists, uh, I don't remember all the details. So when the context changes, it may not be the same interpretation. Exactly. The, it, the same as may not be applicable in a different context. Yeah, that's so so uh, the problem is that uh, in in let's say link open data when people assert same as. Uh, that assertion is uh, maybe valid in a particular context, even if it is valid. And when you look at the same data, a, a same thing, relationship in another context, it may not be valid, right? Yeah, there were debates like then how then you, someone can think you may never use same as, but then that's the uh, analysis and then right. right, right. So, but the point here is that now suppose you were to define um, uh, knowledge base to be reused. Right. Let's say something in the link open data, and you want that to be, you, you hope that that will be reused, and yet if you don't model the context in which uh, your assertions are valid, uh, and try to use it in the context, you might be making a lot of errors, or it may not be applicable, or it may be wrong. Right. So this is what makes the life very hard, and this is where, you know, some of the things we started continuous semantics, you know, providing con you know uh, context as a very key representation, again. I, I, I know another thing that I take a big pride in is the modeling of semantic proximity, right? If you seen the semantic proximity, right? When did we define semantic proximity? 1992, right? And context was one of the four or five parameters that was, you know, used in defining 
uh, you know, relationship into two objects. Semantic proximity is how related two objects are, how close they are. And in that context was, you know, uh, uh, made a concrete part of it. I, you know, a lot of people have noticed it, they have cited the paper a few hundred times, but still, this is not in practice. Yeah, I think one of the reasons I feel is uh, when we start a research problem, right, I feel the first thing we think of is the uh, availability of a data set. It is very hard to find if we don't have a very specific use case to prove it. I find it uh, So this is the problem with uh, a publication system that, uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, event is good to, you, you must have evaluation even if however limited and simplistic the evaluation is. Uh, and, and that uh, some committee comes up with some standard, uh, you know, benchmark or uh, gold standard and you've got to, you know, everybody writes something on that, which is what is happening with ontology alignment thing, which is rather simplistic uh, and not very practical uh, kind of stuff. So, uh, and again, I, while we all know that, I tell you all the time, why do we have the citations that we do? It's because we talk, take, take, the, take the risk and try, you know, be the first to try and address uh, howsoever partially, uh, you know, those more difficult, more realistic problems. Back to you. Thank you. So, uh, next, um, it talks about what is beyond the scripts. Images from Google. <laughs> <laughs> So now we are thinking that what a computer understanding system should be able to do, like understand new or unexpected situations. For that proverb example, unexpected proverb. A plan things out, we, uh, we need to plan things out in a new situation without having to resort to a script. If we don't have a script, then how do we understand the situation? How do we program it or how do we make sense out of the context? if we don't have a script at all. So that is real understanding. How do we, um, in the ability to establish connections between pieces of the information for which no prescribed set of rules or scripts exist. We don't, uh, suppose in that case, Dr. Seth was presenting that if we don't know, if there is a proverb, we don't know the proverb, right? Then what can we do? How do we understand the proverb? So recognize general elements of connectivity between events in, um, and then the principles for organizing seemingly disparate events in meaningful ways. How do we connect events in a meaningful way? Estimate what to do in a certain situation or even a rarely encountered one. How do we approach a situation which we don't have in our script? And then need and desire to understand what actions people do and why why people do these actions. We need to uh, give the computer a mechanism to understand the what and why of this. Uh, this is the evaluating the reasoning processes. That is, how do we uh, understand the process? Why did he do what he just did? The computer uh, should ask this, why? What is he trying to do? What is the meaning of this uh, context? What is his plan next? So, um, natural language processing introduced the concept of natural language processing in this. So, natural language processing helps a lot in um, reasoning these processes. Uh, NLP enables computer programs to understand unstructured text by using machine learning <coughs> and artificial intelligence. By that, we can make inferences and then we can provide the context to the language. Just but as whose who's claim is this? Is this Shen. This is Shank's claim. Yes. Well, just as human brains do. So, then is define knowledge structure for goals and plans. Concepts must be given to a program in order to enable it to understand what goals and plans people make. We must give the concepts to the program. So there are different goals for changing the state of something that has been defined. There, there are five states, uh, the change in proximity, desire for a change in location or the proximity, that is one changing of state, another there is a change control, this is the desire for achieving position, possession or control over something, 
that is one state that can be defined another state is change of knowledge desire for acquisition of knowledge change in social control desire for a power power or authority to do something that is another state that can be defined and then there is a change of agency that is desire for getting someone else to pursue a goal on our behalf this can be defined so these are the different states which define our goals um, as per this book so how do we satisfy these desires these are all desires change of proximity control knowledge or social control all these are desires so how do we satisfy these desires we need goals plans for our goals in defining them so there is a standard set of methods that are used in planning the state of change uh, uh, the change of state so standard plans um, this is an example which is given in the book <coughs> standard plans for achieving a change proximity so in this case we are changing our location we have a desire to change our location how can we do that there are sub plans for this goal use private vehicle use public transportation use animal or yourself just walk by yourself these are the sub plans of the ultimate goal or the ultimate state that we want this is the example which is given in the book suppose this is a sentence frank wanted to go to bahamas this is a context he picked up a newspaper what do we infer from this frank wanted to go to bahamas this uh this sentence this part of the con uh this out of these two sentences the first <coughs> sentence gives us that frank wants to change his proximity again he picked up a newspaper so how do we connect this picking up a newspaper to changing our proximity reading newspaper might be a standard plan for change in knowledge or it might be a sub goal in service of the larger goal that is change in proximity goal how do we infer that he picked up a newspaper maybe he is just uh, checking in the newspaper what are the travel tickets or anything for our goal that the prop change in proximity so we depend on the context being helpful to our understanding of the story so if you understand the story if we can connect both the sentences then we can infer out a meaningful approach to understanding this entire context of the story again if we if we input frank wanted wanted to go to bahamas he picked up a newspaper he began reading the fashion section so how do we uh, connect this he began reading the fashion section to our story or the context human brain will find a link to make to make between the fashion and bahamas how will we find that <coughs> how will we find inferences to link both these contexts we might think that if he is reading the fashion section maybe he is checking out to buy clothes for his change in proximity for going to bahamas that we can do but how do computer link um, this out of context thing into the context and make out connect all the events and make out an inference that is the question he is posing in the book next there is a art of persuasion so we need getting uh, we need to get others to do what we want to do so uh, all the desires which has been defined previously in the previous slides for that we need the art of persuasion so there are six plans of persuasion that is that that will come under the persuade package we define different strategies in that suppose we have a change in goal appearing in our program then how do we define the set of strategies we can ask or we can invoke the theme we can invoke inform the reason we can bargain the object bargain the favor or we can threaten just uh, these are the arts of persuasion or the strategies that we can do in order to achieve our goal there can be two more strategies for change in control <coughs> one is steel or overpower so all the strategies uh, what he means is all the strategies we can define depending on our goal this is the example is uh, is given james knew that his wife's surgery would be very expensive this is the first sentence there was always uncle harry 
He reached for the phone book. How do we connect all these sentences and make uh, meaning out of, make a story out of it? The first sentence we can infer out James needs money. So that is change of control <coughs> of money. James doesn't have money, he needs money, he needs to take control of the money from somebody else to himself. So now he needs the art of persuasion. He needs to persuade somebody who has the money to change its control and give it to James. That's how our brain works, step by step. So now for persuading someone, you need to communicate. The need to communicate with the person who has the control of the object or uh, the money. So then comes un Uncle Harry. So we can connect these two sentences. James knew that he was, um, these two uh, different contexts. James knew his wife's surgery would be expensive and there was always Uncle Harry. We can now connect both these uh, different contexts and make out a story out of it that Uncle Harry is the person who is uh, needed to give the change of control of money. Next, he reached for the phone book. Next sentence. What does this have to do with <coughs> Uncle Harry? He needs to telephone Uncle Harry. That's why he is looking at the phone book. That is the subplan. That is the subplan persuade. He needs to persuade him. So, uh, what in this example is um, explaining is how do we connect different sentences which individually make no sense and connect them together and then uh, infer the meaning out of it. Our brain can easily do that. So how do we model the computer to derive the meaning out of different sentences and getting a story out of so it? So do you have the answer? No. Well, I do. So the, the really important part of, of this approach is the assumption that human behavior is accounted for by plans. So if you're going to look at the natural language, what you have to do is infer the plan and the goals that sit behind that natural language. And, and our reasoning and inference about human behavior is at the planning level, not the, not the, not the language level. That's the general take-home message here. And I would say there's a huge amount of psychologists that have this uh, impression about what governs human behavior. So that, that, that is that we have everything planned out. Well, that not necessarily not necessarily that the plans are pre-compiled, yes. but that the, the, the cognitive process is fundamentally a process of planning. And you have abstract goals and constraints combining with a situation that generate a plan of action in a particular situation. I would say that's probably the modal notion of human cognition these days. Uh, and, I, and I believe uh, many problems come uh, from these plans because human, uh, usually human, um, we don't plan only one way, right? Right. So many plans we have around us we don't know which one is the best. Yes. We, for example, we are going to choose one of them, and maybe that's not good. Show. I mean, that's good, that's not good plan. And uh, many. Uh, so you back up. Yes, we get depression. We get many things <laughs> from the back show, back decision. So many problems come from this plan. Right? Well, it, it can. You I mean you have to be able to monitor your plan and know when when you're when when you fail. But a bigger conceptual problem is the extent to which. This, mo this modal model is um, really capturing a, a causal explanation of human behavior. So where does it stop? Okay, so you have a plan here for getting money from your uncle to, to pay for surgery. Do you have a plan for opening up this door and walking down the hallway? I think that Do is that's where a psychologist has to. When we well, get consultation from psychologists, they just analyze this uh, different ways. Well, there it doesn't, doesn't look possible. so promising there. That's the kind of thing that John was talking about. When you get to physical behavior, this notion that we carry around abstract plans and they guide our behavior is a little bit questionable because it, it's not possible to be uh, okay. real-time responsive if you've got this big, big load of plan that you're carrying around with you. So 
that's sort of the, the, the debate in the, in the psychological community about the, the causality of these plans in, in determining our behavior. But for sure, he's, he's going down the pathway where you can't make sense of linguistic behavior without analyzing the plan behind it and the goals behind it. So uh, this is, how do we program computers for understanding our plans? So machines must understand what has been said. How every word, they carry the meanings. How these meanings allow inferences to be made. And then those inferences allow additional meanings to be understood. People do not say everything that they mean. That's, that this kind of relates to the proverb example. <coughs> So to develop conceptual tools for recognizing specific goal states and desires. Right. See? Yeah. So in order to tell the computers all about our experiences, we really have to understand our own world first. How do our brain is behaving? How do we how do, is our brain behaving? How are we inferring things out? And then we can program that out and give it to the computer that that has to be done. Yeah, uh, I think um, there are different schools of thought, right? So uh, one is that you want computers to do everything that humans do and you want computers to replace humans. And this is a classical John McCarthy kind of uh, 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 you know, vision. And um, for that, uh, I don't know, that you might have to do some of this here. There is other, uh, you know, uh, thing where uh, you are not, you know, planning, you're not expecting the computer to replace everything that human does or even mimic exactly what human does, mm -hmm. but takes a simpler task, uh, you know, more well-defined task, the task where the language, um, you know, you, suppose you have a, um, um, uh, you have a scientific literature, then you are likely to have the kind of, uh, uh, you know, stuff that you discussed earlier in your talk, right? So the things will be all factual, more or less, uh, and there will be no use of proverbs and things of that nature. And so you would not be solving some of those um, uh, tasks that are so complex, uh, and uh, you'll be solving the tasks that are simpler, for example, summarizing that text, or some, for example, extracting factual information from the text. So um, I think this is a very um, high goal and uh, something that I don't think we are achieving it. I think uh, the most sophisticated uh, things happening in the neural nets and deep learning don't claim that you can do any of those things. So with what uh, Shank said, uh, it's uh, still a distant goal. I want to make a side comment. So those of you interested in these general sort of things, uh, NLP in particular, I strongly um, suggest that you also pick up some of the classical paper by uh, Woods. Uh, William Woods, uh, in what's in a link and um, why NLP is, uh, you know, uh, not computational, why, why language understanding is not computationally, you know, doable. And, and so the point, you know, he also gives some wonderful examples, just like Shank started with these some examples here. Um, uh, and uh, that's the classical basic things that you do want to pick up if you don't do NLP. Uh, at least if you're going to do something significant NLP for the long term. And I'll be happy to help you find those papers. Uh, there was um, there's the mind design. The Hoagland book has a whole bunch of this stuff. I think Woods is in there too. Uh, all thank right. Thank you for your <coughs> Well, thank you. And what I liked is that you um, uh, did not completely limit to just what was in the text and try to, you know, uh, make it more uh, current. So that was a good job. Yeah.